The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, it pays to talk to people who were alive and actually active during cycles that are similar to the ones that we're in right now. I'm referring to gold in the 1970s. Of course, we saw gold rise from about $35 an ounce all the way on up to, uh, well, over $800 an ounce. Well, there are people who are alive and active in the market today that you've been with this last week who were actively participating back in the 1970s. Tell us about that. You know, I had a great time at the New Orleans Investment Conference and had a wonderful dinner with Rick Rule and Robert Prechter and David Tice and a whole host of folks who, again, Ian McCavity, the folks who've been around long enough to see major trends and, and be nuanced enough in their approach to have benefited then and now. And painting an adequate picture is very important to us so that investors know where we're at and where we're going. Today's conversation is a part of that. John Embry with Sprout Asset Management has been around and has seen and done a tremendous amount as it relates to the gold market. And just to continue sort of bringing in nuances and, and reinforcing where we're at and where we're going, we want to have that conversation with John today. Well, and I'll tell you, David, John is known for actually putting his money where his mouth is. He, in Barron's Magazine or wherever you see him quoted, he's actually giving quotations as to where he thinks the year will end, and it's usually bold, and he's been right over the last four or five years. So, David, I'd like to hear you guys' conversation. Well, John, we've spent more than a decade with prices of gold or the precious metals appreciating. What would you say to the skeptic at this point? How much further do you think that the markets can go? That's an interesting observation because there have been so many skeptics for so long. And yet gold is probably one of the few assets, if not the only asset, that's going to post a higher year-end close for 12 consecutive years. And that's what seems to be in the offing at this moment for gold. And it, to me, it, the fact that they're still trying to paint it as a you know, bubble or what have you is ridiculous. The fact is that uh, gold is basically reasserting itself as a currency. And when you have all of the major currencies in the world sort of subject to quantitative easing of some degree or another, I mean, to me, gold is just going nowhere but higher. And it's probably going to the pace of the uh, ascent is going to accelerate. John, one of the key observations we've seen, you know, 2000, 2001, up to about 2009, central bankers, seemed to think that it was truly a barbaric relic, and as fast as they could get it off their balance sheet, they would. Now, strangely enough, the emerging markets and those with decent dollar reserve holdings are moving into gold, and, and instead of being net sellers, we have now net buyers in the central bank space. Do you think that's part and parcel to this sort of, quote-unquote, remonetization, or shall we say it being treated as a currency? I think that's exactly what it is, and the fact is that one of the things that has sort of kept pressure on the gold price, even though it's risen for 12 consecutive years, has been the relentless central bank not only selling but leasing of gold. And it was almost exclusively Western central banks. And they were, they were trying to protect their currency systems and keeping, allowing them to keep interest rates low and keeping their financial bubbles going. But a spanner has been thrown into it by the Eastern central banks, who are, as you said, very heavily invested in U.S. dollars, and they recognize how vulnerable they are, and they are now trying to get off these dollars as quickly as possible. And one of the avenues is to buy uh, gold, and they're buying a lot of it. And it's really quite an amazing turnaround, because for years, the central banks, I think, were supplying well over a 1,000 tons to the market through their leasing and selling activities. And now, the Western central banks aren't putting much into the market, and the eastern central banks are taking it out at the tune of four or 500 tons a year. And the swing has been dramatic, and I think this underwrites materially higher prices as we go forward. You know, the investment component is also significant, and we'd be remiss in not pointing out that in this last decade, as central banks have gone from liquidators to purchasers, private investment has actually eclipsed central banks in terms of total ownership of ounces or tons, you know, what does that say about the investment community, your sophisticated large investors 
who prioritize gold. Could we view that as sort of a personal gold standard since uh, central bankers don't? Well, I think it's just the early adapters, the people that have figured out what is going on in the uh, fiat currency system, and they're just running for cover as quickly as possible. So at this point, I think what the buyers have been, as I said earlier, the eastern central banks and a lot of private investors in the east, China, India, what have you, but you have sophisticated people in the West who have you know, large moneyed interests who, uh, who are starting to really sort of go in the direction of gold. I mean, you've seen some, some major names like Bill Gross at PIMCO has been quite uh, you know, positive on the gold situation. John Paulson has been bullish, the hedge fund manager, David Einhorn. So, I mean, I think you're seeing sophisticated investors in the West that know perfectly well where this is going moving towards gold. And I think this is going to be a phenomenon that will continue. And I, that will be one of the major factors in driving the price much higher. And what will be the thing that will lead to the parabolic up move will be when the public itself finally realizes this is a good idea. Amazingly, I think for many, there is this conception that the public is in gold. No, not at all. Going back to the 70s, as, you know, if you looked at global equities, government debt, private investments, Gold came close to 14% of the of total value of all of those markets. So gold was, it was a, a major dominant role or position asset allocation within uh, the, the markets of the day in the 1970s. Today it's between 2 and 2 and a quarter percent. Yeah, I didn't think it was that high, but we're just splitting hairs. But the fact is, the public isn't there at all. And I'll give you a perfect anecdote. My partner, Eric Sprott, went down to speak to a group of reasonably sophisticated investors outside of Toronto, about 100, 120 people in the room. And he asked the question at the beginning of his address, how many people in the room own gold? One person put his hand up. So the idea that the public is invested in gold at this point is wrong. I mean, they, they aren't. And that will be one of the big factors going forward. There's a lot of money on the sidelines that will come into the picture before this is over. Now, this is all demand-related, you know, looking at either central bank demand, investor demand, ETF demand, and whatnot. Maybe you can speak to the supply side. What, what are the trends that you all follow from Toronto that would be important? I mean, activity that comes out of Toronto, a lot of financing. There's two aspects, really. I mean, one thing that has been a bit of a deterrent to higher prices has been an enormous increase in scrap supply. And I see it, I deal with this chap who's in, the, uh, in that area, and he tells me that, I mean, the public is desperate for cash, and they're bringing in, you know, every piece of gold, jewelry, and what have you, anything that has gold in it, melting it down. But that has a finite life. I mean, I told that they did the same thing in Portugal, and now they've pretty well cleaned out the populace. So I don't see that as a long-term issue, although it's been a bit of a short-term deterrent. More importantly is the mine supply. And the mine supply is, I don't know, 2,500 tons, give or take. And this is where it's open to considerable debate. Like, there's a lot of people that think mine supply is going to rise materially as the price moves higher. And I don't think so, And they, certainly in the next five years, for several reasons. I mean, clearly there's geopolitical issues. I mean, you've seen this, these issues down in South Africa where you've had enormous production interruption. But the other thing that's going to be difficult there's not a lot of new large ore bodies being discovered. And anything that is being discovered, particularly if it's out in a reasonably remote area, the cost of bringing this stuff into production now is enormous. And so I would dare say that if five years from now the gold price was just for the sake of argument twice where it is now, I don't think mine production will be up at all. I think it'll still be stuck about where it is today. So I see nothing sort of alleviating the shortage of gold from a you know, rising demand coming out of the mine side. On the mine side, I mean, we've got $200 an ounce, which was the cost to mine gold, say, 10, 12 years ago. Now, as I understand it, it's over 1000 maybe even pressing $1,300 an ounce on average. So you're right, there's not a lot of motive for war bodies to, uh, to, to, to be brought into production. Uh, because you're not talking about a tremendous return you know, when you're looking at R&D and everything that goes into to bringing something online. But you're right. I guess the big issue is we haven't seen major ore bodies discovered. It's an excellent observation. Like most of the stuff that is being discovered 
is being discovered in the neighborhood of existing mines and what have you. There are very few what I would call greenfield discoveries. And one of the problems is where these things may occur, it's often so geopolitically questionable. Like I remember being involved with a situation down in Ecuador where they found, I would think, probably the biggest ore body, virgin ore body in the last 10, 15 years. Well, it still hasn't gone anywhere because the government down there is is just sort of basically gotten in the way. So I don't see mine supply being any sort of a factor, additional mine supply, in suppressing the price going forward. I think we're going to have major physical shortages. By geopolitical, I mean, a part of what you're saying is it's just a less friendly geography. You, you can't ramp up production. But there's no, you know, Nevadas waiting around in the wings that are very open to a robust and mature mining industry getting going. Well, that's correct. I mean, you're finding ore bodies in Eritrea, Ecuador, and all sorts of exotic places that you'd never go for a holiday. And, I mean, it's really hard, particularly in, in, in a difficult economic environment where governments need every cent, to sort of get a fair regime that's going to treat a mine because they see the mine being on their property fairly. So I think that, like, from an investment perspective, I'm much more comfortable in sort of places like Canada, the United States, Australia, and that, where there is a rule of law and a long history of respecting people's property rights. So far in the conversation, we haven't talked about quantitative easing. We haven't talked about monetary policies, fiscal policies. You know, driving the gold price, the backstory is really something very basic. If you went back to Econ 101, it is supply and demand. That simple. Then you've got sort of the icing on the cake. <laughs> Maybe you can speak to that, whether it's the fiscal cliff or monetary policies that you see sort of accelerating. You've identified the single most important factor in why people should own precious metals. I mean, there's a finite supply of precious metals as there have been through all of history. And right now, we're in yet another experiment with fiat paper currency where we've gone too far. And the only solution to keeping this thing afloat and moving forward is quantitative easing to infinity, as my friend Jim Sinclair said. And I agree with him. I think basically that if they were to turn the taps off and if they were, heaven forbid, raise interest rates to any extent, the economy would literally collapse. And since nobody wants that to happen on their watch, What's going to happen is more and more quantitative easing in all of the Western uh, countries. And to me, that means that the currencies, there'll be competitive currency devaluation going on everywhere. And gold stands out as a beacon of safety in, in that type of environment. This may be, you know, just playing a little devil's advocate here, but going back 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, China and India we're not quite the dominant force in the gold market that they are today. They've just about doubled their presence in the gold market, even while the U.S. and the Middle East has cut their interest in half. One concern would be, with the slowing global economy, with the idea that Chinese GDP is is, is not going gangbusters at double-digit rates, do you think that could have a negative impact on the gold price? No, I don't, for the simple reason that, I mean, the Chinese have a vested interest in making sure that their economy moves forward and certainly doesn't sort of lapse into a Western-style uh, decline. And to do that, they will create more and more money, which I think will be inflationary. So I, I think the Chinese public already have a healthy distrust of paper money. I mean, that, that was where the, it was invented. So I, I don't see that as being a deterrent, really. I mean, uh, I think that it's almost in their DNA, the owning gold. So unless uh, things were to just flat out collapse, which might basically, you know, have a small deterrent in the short run, I don't see that as a factor at all. And I mean, there's two environments in which gold really shines. One is the obvious mounting inflation as the papers debase. The other one is deflationary collapse, because at that point, all of your other assets are brought into, uh, you know, nobody wants to really be comfortable with bonds or stocks or anything in that environment. And gold will, in that environment, emerge too. So as long as you don't have sort of long-term disinflation as we had from 1980 to 2000, which was a terrible period for gold, and we're not going back there any time in my lifetime, certainly, I think the environment for gold is terrific. So that begs the question in terms of a time frame. For me, I think we've gone so far. Again, going back to what we talked about earlier, we've been in a bull market for 12 years. We've seen nearly double-digit growth rates for 12 years. That question of sustainability, 
maybe you can shed some light on what a commodity super cycle looks like. And when one of these markets gets into motion, how far does it tend to go? Well, in this instance, when I mean, basically, you're sort of comparing it to paper currency, which is in a state of, I think, terminal decline. It's very hard to put an upside in this. I, I could tell you 10,000, but, but that, that's not important. I think the key is to realize that it is in an upward trend, and the upward trend is going to accelerate. And I don't know where it's going to go in terms of uh, U.S. dollars or any other currency on Earth. All I know is that it's going to go up a lot from where it is, and I think we should focus less on the actual, actual numbers than basically on the parabolic trend that's coming. And the fact that so few people are there, I mean, there's probably never been an asset on earth that's gone up sevenfold, and everybody's kind of disdainful of it. I mean, it's amazing. If the stock market had acted like this over the last 12 years, people would be falling all over themselves to get involved. The average person doesn't have a clue. It's amazing. It is also interesting to see gold as a less correlated asset wouldn't say non-correlated, but, but it's, I would say it's non-correlated, certainly to financial assets, unless you'd say it was an opposite correlation. And in that case, doesn't it, with time, have even greater appeal to an investment community who's looking at, uh, again, paper assets and saying, maybe we need something different? Without question, you see, why I'm so optimistic right here is the very fact that this phenomenon hasn't even started yet. And it's the central bankers who are in the fray today, you think the investment community tomorrow, and perhaps the man on the street still out there on the horizon. Absolutely. And I, I've had a, I had a friend who was certainly a huge player in the 70s. And he said to me a long time ago, he said, John, the public won't even notice this stuff until it's over 2500 bucks." And I kind of scoffed at him. But you know what? He was right. <laughs> it's shocking. When you compare the options that investors have. You know, as, as the Dow's moved to 13,000 and above, it's captured their imagination, and certainly the idea of 15, 18, 20,000 on the Dow, you know, it, it's almost like the guy who wrote the book over a decade ago calling for 36,000. Oh, the 36,000 guys, yeah, I well, know. <laughs> maybe someday, but between now and then, we've had the Dow Gold Ratio collapse from 42, 43 to 1, down to about 8 to 1 today. What do you think is a reasonable relative relationship between paper assets and gold? Could the ratio go negative? I don't think it'll go negative, but I, I have no reason to believe that it won't do what it's done several times in the past, and that gets down somewhere between 1 to 1 or 2 to 1. I mean, the question you can debate is whether the Dow is going to go down a lot so gold doesn't go up as much, or they're both going to go up, except gold is going to go up 6 or 8 times as fast. But it's interesting you bring that up, because I used to give speeches, I don't know, eight, ten years ago, to disbelieving audiences, and I was using the Dow-Gold ratio. Then it was around, I don't know, 25, 30 to 1, and I said, you know, this thing is probably headed for 2 to 1. And they'd just look at me like I had two heads. And guess what? We're already down to 8 to 1, and they still don't get it. And the amazing thing is, if they're doing the math, going from 42 or 43 to 1 to 8 to 1 is a five times increase in your purchasing power. But the difference, even on the conservative side, to two to one from current levels is a greater increase than what we've seen over the last 10 years. I know. And I believe fervently that's going to happen. And there's one other aspect that we haven't even dealt with. And this is a huge part of the whole equation in my mind. And that is the fact that there's an enormous amount of what I refer to as paper gold out there. ETFs, pooled accounts, gold certificates. And it's backed by a minimal amount of gold that's been hypothecated and rehypothecated so many times, nobody knows who owns what. But there's probably a $100 claim on every $1 worth of physical gold. And I honestly believe that before this thing runs its course, a lot of people that are holding paper gold are going to be disabused of their sort of belief, and they're going to be forced to sort of move towards the physical. And that's going to be one of the real catalysts to driving this price dramatically higher. And it's interesting you mentioned that because this last week I spent some time with a trader. He's an options and futures contract trader, does this professionally in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And in his 25-year career, he's had one client take delivery of 100 ounces of gold. Yep. Everyone else was content to hold warehouse receipts. Just trading paper and make it get more paper. But does, See, I think that that will change. He's never gone through the exercise. In nope. 25 years in the profession, he'd never gone through the exercise of helping a client take physical delivery that is correct. of cold. It was mind-boggling. I mean, I, I thought, you have to be kidding me. 
I mean, surely there's more people who, when they trade gold, look at their profits and say, hey, why don't you send me 100 ounces? And every time you have a 100 ounce profit above and beyond what you want to keep and sort of roll forward, he said, no, this is the first time in his career anyone had taken 100 ounces off the exchange. Well, that's interesting because, you see, I believe that that's just starting. I've been told by several people in this kind of a position that there is interest now that people are becoming a little queasy about their paper gold vehicles. And at the margin, they're starting to sort of sell them and look for you know real physical gold. Or they're demanding, to, in, in the case where they have the right, they can demand delivery. They're doing that, too. And it's nascent stages. And I, I think given the sort of the, the number of claims there are in the average ounce, that I, I think that this is going to be an enormous contributor to much higher prices. John, we have a company in Europe as well, and we've seen huge demand, retail demand for gold in Europe for obvious reasons. It's now no longer an imaginative, hypothetical risk out there on the horizon, but in real time, people are concerned about what's going to happen to their savings should they put them in the local bank, and they're coming up with a solid no as an answer. And certainly they've seen the declines of 60, 80, even 90 percent in certain equity markets in Europe, and they're concerned there too. What do you think will drive the U.S. investor to an awareness of gold? I, mean, I think there's two things. I think one is that once we get beyond this election, I think everything's just in a hold right now for this election. And once that's behind us, they're going to have to confront the fiscal cliff. And I, I don't quite know what they're going to do. But if they were actually to address it and sort of take an enormous amount of stimulus out of the economy, I think the economy might collapse. So I don't think they'll do that. I think then there'll be you know, another increase in the debt limit, and then more and more people will start to realize that there's no solution to this. And then I think there's a very real probability at some point in time that the U.S. stock market is going to quit levitating. And if it were to take a real smack, I think at that point there would be more interest in, in protection and things like gold. Back to that issue of non-correlation. And so 2013 to 2016 could very well be the day that the U.S. balance sheet's put in the limelight, U.S. investing public is drawn into gold in, in a real way, at least the investing community, if not the man on the street. Any parting shots, any, any parting comments? I think for sure that's going to happen. I, I have the belief that, you know, and I don't think it's accidental that the focus has been on Europe. I mean, you've had the U.S. ratings agencies cutting all the rankings in various European countries and their debt and what have you. And what it's basically done is kept the focus off the United States, who's rolled merrily along without any attempt to control their budget deficits. And I think that it's an insoluble problem now. The lines are too far apart between revenues and, and expenditures. And the focus is going to come back to the United States, particularly when we have to deal with the fiscal cliff and, what, and debt limits and what have you. And at that point, that conceivably, there will be a percentage of the American public that goes, oh my goodness, I need some protection. And I think that could be very positive for gold. So looking at the sociological, the, the psychological dynamics, you were very aware and very active in the last bull market in precious metals, 1970s and early 80s. What years do you think serve as parallel? What is right now? Where are we now? I would think we're 74, 75, maybe, where we were going through sort of a difficult period, maybe a little later. But it, most people forget that the vast move in the gold price came in the last year and a half. I mean, it, for the longest time, it languished between 200 and 400 and messed around. And then all of a sudden, between 79 and 80, it roared up there to uh, 850. You know, we aren't there at all yet. And I think that the next, you know, the step will be, as we talked earlier, that first you'll get more of these investors in, and then eventually the public will get in. But That'll be sort of the equivalent when that happens to what happened in 79 and 80, except this time the problems are far worse. There's less physical gold available, so I think the upside move will be, if, believe it or not, even greater. Well, and it argues that that parabolic move, how far ever it is, how short the time span may be, it's particularly rewarding to someone who has a reasonably low-cost basis. Well, as, as I've always said time. to people throughout this entire bull market, I said, this market is interfered with quite regularly, and I, I've never recommended buying particular strengths, particularly if the open interest has grown a lot on COMEX. But if you just basically dollar averaged or bought obvious periods of weakness, you've put in position and, phys and bought physical. You've put in position a wonderful uh, inventory at a great prices, 
And I, at this point, I would continue to do that. But at some point, it will break away. And at that point, people are going to have to chase it. It hasn't happened yet. You can pick your spots and just keep buying. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned dollar cost averaging. Let's in on a family secret. My dad is notoriously bad in timing. And, you know, he made the mistake of buying at the peak at 400 made the mistake of buying at the peak at 700 made the mistake again of buying at the peak at 900 and again at about 1100 You know, he keeps on buying at exactly the wrong time. And we look in retrospect and say, I'm glad he's consistent. I'm glad he's consistent. But yeah, building a good position over a long period of time, doing so on a dollar cost average basis, uh, in anticipation of a parabolic move. There will be a huge move. and I mean, if you're not on margin, and I've always recommended that people eschew margin, do not go near margin in a market that's this volatile, intentionally created. You've got a position you can always maintain. And when you've got excess cash and there's an opportunity, buy more. And I think that you'll be in perfect position when the big move occurs. And I suspect that will happen probably within the next 12 to 18 months. Listen, we've been doing this commentary for five years, and I think you've been on at least five times. We appreciate your addition to the conversation. You bring sage insight and always have enjoy having you on the conversation. Well, it's my pleasure. Anytime you want to chat, uh, you know where I am. Thanks, John. We'll, we'll be coming to Toronto soon. Okay. Okay. Take care. Well, David, John, is always a fascinating conversation regarding gold. I also know that silver factors into this. Gold, of course, is a more consistently rising. It's more predictable because it's it's a longer-term type of hedge. But silver factors on that as well. You know, we watch the gold-silver ratio, and a lot of people are starting to eye silver right now because of the ratio. Would you comment on that? Even in our conversation with John, we were talking about paper currency as being in terminal decline and that being reflected in the price of gold. Well, when you're talking about paper currencies, the flip side of that is a hard currency like gold. Gold is the currency of kings. Silver is the currency of the common man. And you're going to see silver move in lockstep with gold. I've said before it would be in fifths and starts, but certainly following the same trend. At a 53 and a half to 1 ratio today compared to gold, silver is likely to outperform handily. The reality is we look at precious metals not as a speculation, we're not in the contest for what performs the best. We're actually just wanting to preserve assets and ensure family net worth from one generation to the next. Having said that, if someone does not own silver, they should. Having said that, if they own too much silver, we don't like that. We don't like that because it truly is something that is, is more volatile and will tend to give you more heartburn as, as time goes on. So for, for someone who has a cast iron stomach, perhaps that's appropriate. But our view is that it needs to be in the mix in precious metals, and certainly it would be remiss in saying, you know, our whole conversation with John, although it had to do with gold today, our position as a company, our position as a company is that silver is, is incredibly bullish, and maybe the investment of the decade. Well, David, you said it right when you said that silver is more volatile, but I really appreciate what John Embry has to say about margin. You know, we talk about trying to get more gain on something that we're speculating in by putting it on margin, but the problem is it's so volatile, both gold and silver, and these markets are so unpredictable in the short run that that can really burn you. But what's amazing about the gold-silver ratio that I've always loved is it has the same effect of margin in increasing your overall balance sheet without actually putting you into a margin situation. Explain the ratio trade that is sometimes it's appropriate to have more silver, sometimes it's appropriate to have less, but you actually, in a way, leverage your growth. You and I have talked about never falling in love with an asset, and I think to be overly bullish on silver or overly bullish on gold, it shouldn't be in light of the metal itself. It should be in relation to something else. And, and the reality is, if it's a better value, then it deserves an emphasis. If it's not as good a value, then it doesn't deserve an emphasis. And so that's why, again, that historic relationship is so important to us. The average for the last 200 years has been 31 to 1 on the silver to gold ratio. 31 ounces of silver equal to 1 ounce of gold. Because it's in the 50 range, that speaks very loudly that silver is undervalued relative to gold. It shouldn't take so many ounces of silver. Or in essence, you're getting 40% silver for free when you're looking at that historic norm not bringing in the Hunt Brother days, not bringing in a 15 or 16 to 1 ratio, which is a very popular dimension, but I would say is, is really a long shot. We know the in-ground numbers. We know the last few years have come out closer to 12 to 1, but still we think the conservative number to shoot for is closer to 30 to 1. Having said that, we're only interested in silver because it fits that value equation. If it were overpriced, 
if it were a different number relative to gold, we might not even mention it. Well, David, this just goes back to correct allocation with the whole portfolio. You know, we've talked before that you always want to try to have one-third of your total liquid assets in precious metals. And then of that one-third, various mix of gold and silver, sometimes more gold than silver, sometimes more silver than you normally would relative to gold. In this particular case, we're just saying it may be time to look at the allocation. You know, in final thought, I, I think John's comments about us moving towards a parabolic move in gold yeah, that, that would imply significantly higher prices. And I think silver is, is in that same step forward. But I, I want to caution investors to not be thinking with great excitement and enthusiasm about what that would do to improve their balance sheet, because the reality is you have a harder decision. It's not as important that you have already said yes to owning gold and silver. It's more important that you consider what you do as prices get to peak and even unsustainable levels. We don't know if that's two years from now or seven years from now, but this is where I think a mature investor begins to make the decision ahead of time. How many ounces of gold do you want to hand on to the next generation? How many ounces of gold will be enduring in your portfolio? And the ones that exceed that amount, those are the ones that you need to be willing to let go of at some point. So again, our suggestion of a reduction strategy, not an exit, but a reduction strategy is absolutely paramount. Are we implementing that today? Emphatically, no. But you have to process these things intellectually before you get to make the decision emotionally in a very difficult moment. And that's why we think you need to be thinking ahead, even though there is a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about the way the next few years may shape up for us as precious metals investors. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney, and our guest today, John Embry. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Or give us a call anytime at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.